Hi, everybody. First of all, let me thank uh, Extra Muros for this uh, wonderful initiative to organize a series of last lectures and to ask me to be the first one to give the last lecture. I must say that this invitation troubled me rather a lot. I was wondering what really is a last lecture? It's supposed to be about words of wisdom, but what is a last lecture? And especially the word last, I found it very complicated. L-A-S-T, what it, would it mean? And then suddenly it dawned on me that of course you had meant an acronym, L-A-S-T, meaning Liberal Arts and Sciences in Tilburg. That is <laughs> what it's all about, isn't it? And of course there is a literal meaning as well. Uh, and the literal meaning is that somebody is going to speak, understanding that this might be the last opportunity to say some really important things to the audience. And to me this was a, a thought experiment that was rather difficult. And one cause for difficulty is that I don't want it to be sermonizing. I am not a preacher, I'm a teacher. So what I want to do is simply provide you with a number of lessons. The number will be three, as everybody understands why that is. And uh, fortunately, in between, there will be some uh, guitar music. So uh, there will be a kind of dialogue uh, immediately because of that. And my second cause for concern, which went a little deeper, was that I think, looking back on my own experiences in giving lectures to people, which I have been doing for many years, I think a lecture is always open-ended. You always speak in the expectation, in the hope of some response, that the audience will react. You all know that without an audience there cannot be a speaker. So that means open-endedness, expecting a response, pushing towards new subjects, opening to the future. It's an act of beginning. Even the last words begin something new. But this difficult predicament, how could I speak the last words when I hoped it would... All my speaking is hoping to create some, something new, some beginning. It did open the door to my first topic, which is politics. Politics conceived as the art of speaking and acting that creates new beginnings for a community. And I will talk about what it is like to enter politics yourself, to engage in its deliberations and machinations and judgments and things like that, and how you supposedly begin with idealism. You have some ideals, you want to change the world, and then you encounter difficulties and you encounter realism. And I will talk about the tension between these two attitudes and, and frames of mind. So that by way of introduction. Then my first part of the lecture. Let me begin by introducing myself to you. Not that you do not know me, but you do not know everything you need to know in for order to follow this uh, lecture. When I went to the university in the 1970s, there were no programs like liberal arts anywhere in the Netherlands. But I was one of those people who had a lot of interests. I was interested in literature, in history, in philosophy. But I chose to go to Leiden to study political science with a lot of law in it as well. And I hope to find some of my interests in that way. Why did I turn to politics? It wasn't really my inclination to do so. My inclination was really to read poems and to write poems and to think about all the higher topics of life, etc. And still I thought in this moment in time, people should turn to politics. It was shortly after the revolution year 1968, when people took to the streets in Paris and in Berkeley and a sense of immense change was in the air. And what prompted me to take politics was the appearance in 1968 of the report of the Club of Rome, the limits to growth, based on what was then very modern computer research at MIT by Jay Forrester, the Club of Rome predicted an ecological crisis. And I thought this ecological crisis is going to be so severe 
that we will have to go into politics to find solutions. And of course, um, I started studying politics in the hope that in a couple of years' time we would find the answer to these problems, and my expectations were dashed. Rather, the study of politics showed us that um, it was very hard to change political structures of democratic societies. And um, the solutions that came up in the debates then were also not very satisfying. I be believe that at the end, most people thought that what was really needed was mentality change. And if you have mentality change, then politics will change, etc., etc. But how do you get mentality change? Don't you need uh, political leaders for that to start that? There was this kind of vicious circle uh, going around in the 70s in this kind of ID. Well, it's a lot later. This year we celebrate the fact that um, it's 40 years ago that the Club of Rome started. They met in Amsterdam some time ago with hundreds of people. We are still debating the thesis of the Club of Rome and we see that on most points they were right. They were right that there are too many people on the globe, that we don't use our resources in a wise way, that development problems persist, that there is too much pollution, that we are heading for ecological catastrophe unless something drastic is changing. And again, we are debating these issues. And did we have large-scale mentality change in those 40 years? Well, we had some small and important attitude changes, but not the kind of overall thing that should be necessary. And we still need responsible citizens and leaders. So, it's not over yet. Now, let me explain my central terms. I'm going to talk about politics, about idealism and about realism. Let me begin with what I mean by, by politics. To me, this is not a distant spectacle. It is community life according to the Athenian ideal that was formulated by Aristotle. Aristotle writes in, one of, in his, one of his books, the state belongs to the class of objects that exist by nature, and man is by nature a political animal. Anyone who by his nature and not simply by ill luck has no state is either too bad or too good, either subhuman or superhuman. He is like the war mad man condemned in Homer's words as having no family, no law, no home. For he is a non cooperator, like an isolated piece in a game of drafts. Nature has endowed man alone among the animals with the power of speech. Speech serves to indicate what is useful and what is harmful, and so also what is just and what is unjust. It is the sharing of a common view in these matters that makes a household and a nation. Now, this is a famous uh, passage where Aristotle explains that we are all political animals. And when I started studying in Leiden, I was very fortunate to meet someone who would be my mental guide through uh, my studies. That was uh, Herman van Gunsteren, a professor of political theory. And he told me, if you're worrying about the environment so much, the book to read is Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition. And I found Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition a very, very complicated book. Most of the passages were completely above my head. But I found there a few passages where she tells what politics is and I immediately recognized those. And that is where she takes up Aristotle, interpreting and extending his thinking. Hannah Arendt has this to say. The polis, properly speaking, is not the city-state in its physical location, it is the organization of the people as it arises out of acting and speaking together. And its true space lies between people living together for this purpose, no matter where they happen to be. The space of appearance comes into being wherever men are together in the manner of speech and action, and therefore predates and precedes all formal constitution of the public realm and the various forms of government. <laughs> that is the various forms in which the public realm can be organized. So what she is saying here, any time that people join together to speak and act and decide on certain things, that is where politics arises. And if I am today not the only one to speak and other people start speaking as well, this could be a place of politics. Any place where politics arises is a place where a beginning can be made, where something new can happen. So we can learn from Aristotle and Arendt that the political 
is not the same as politics in the sense of the organized institutional practices or the power struggles that go on in a political system. The political is the engine of politics in an institutional sense. It is an art of speaking and acting together, like in passing a law and deciding upon new rules. And it keeps the political system alive and meaningful for the citizens. So this was an, a message of hope I gleaned from uh, Hannah Arendt, even if I didn't know how to act upon that or to find other people that could act on it. So that's my first term, the term politics, and it's slightly unusual in that usually people in talking about politics immediately go to the political system and forget that it must get its energy, its drive, its life from the way ordinary people as citizens speak and act together. Then idealism. Idealism, um, we all have ideals, but we can think of idealism as a <coughs> prophetic vision or a statement of ideals or a declaration of principles. And in politics, this is very important and you find it in many places, such as constitutions or human rights <coughs> treaties. But in the history of political theory, a good example of idealism is the work of Immanuel Kant. Not an easy philosopher, but fortunately he wrote a very accessible book called Perpetual Peace, in which he designs his ideas for ending war in Europe and creating a federation of free states that will respect the liberty and the autonomy of all its members. That was the vision that Kant had late in the in the 18th century. And he says, for instance, in this, uh, this book, the following, a republican constitution is founded upon three principles. <coughs> Firstly, the principle of freedom for all members of a society as men. Secondly, the principle of the dependence of everyone upon a single common legislation as subjects. And thirdly, the principle of legal equality for everyone as citizens. That is an example of a, an idealist motive in politics. And his ideal was not really so distant from that of Aristotle in saying that a republic means <coughs> that we are all citizens equally and that we can in turn be citizens and also leaders. But how can this happen? The republic cannot exist in the realm of ideas alone. It has to find shape in the real world against opposing forces. It has to rule over powerful systems of technology, economics, etc. How can this be done? So when you start asking how can this be done, we have to look at realism. Realism means considerations about power and strategy, the awareness of having to adapt constantly to changing circumstances and to seek new chances. <coughs> and I also have a quotation on realism. And this comes from Machiavelli. Machiavelli writes in The Prince the following. Everyone realizing how praiseworthy it is for a prince to honor his word and to be straightforward rather than crafty in his dealings. Nonetheless, contemporary experience shows that princes who have achieved great things have been those who have given their word lightly, who have known how to trick men with their cunning and who in the end have overcome those abiding by honest principles. You must understand, therefore, that there are two ways of fighting, by law or by force. The first way is natural to men and the second to beasts. But as the first way often proves inadequate, one must needs have recourse to the second. So a prince must understand how to make a nice use of the beast and the man. Well, this is realism speaking. And all of these were sources that Hannah Arendt was thinking about and commenting upon. From these quotations alone, we can already see that there is a conflict between idealism, the way of Kant, and realism, the way of Machiavelli. And yet, my thesis today is that both have a place in the active life of citizens that participate in the politics of their community. I'm going to give an example. The example of the regime we now live in, the European Union after the Second World War. After the carnage of the Second World War, who would have predicted that there would be perpetual peace between countries like Germany, 
France and England. It has happened. Why has it happened? It has happened because after the Second World War, in light of all the terrible things that had happened, there were some courageous people who came together and started this idea of the European Union. There is this great series by Geert Mack on Europe, where you see some of the architects of the European community of coal and steel, that's what it started with, and how they met in some, some house in Luxembourg and at first had some misgivings that there was also a German at their table, but soon discovered that this German person was decent and that they could construct some ideas for a peaceful union. If they hadn't done it, the European Union wouldn't have come uh, into being. But then, if there hadn't been political leaders who ruthlessly exploited their options in negotiating with each other and played the hard games of power politics, we wouldn't have had this powerful European Union that we have today. So both idealism and realism went into the making of the <coughs> European Union. Well, my preferences as a political animal are with the conception of politics espoused by Aristotle, Arendt and Kant. I personally would not want to live under full Machiavellian rule, and I suppose that Machiavelli wouldn't either. And this means that citizenship, the republican ideal, that should be the basis of all activities in politics, and that especially extends to the call for leadership. I don't know whether you have perhaps at one time in your life encountered all these wonderful brochures where management schools like the TIAS, where we are now, tell you that they can make you into tomorrow's leaders of the free world in economics, in business, etc., etc. These ideas come from management theory and economic life. They don't seem to have been too successful in all financial systems. Um, but they are never extended to politics. And that is strange. In fact, when you look at our political representatives, all political parties find it very difficult to find people from the business world to enter politics because people in business have a disdain for politics. It's, it's dirty and you can't earn money in politics, which is also a consideration. But my idea of citizenship entails that all leadership functions should be based in citizenship and that people in economic life should also enter politics. But what are your ideas? I hope to be hearing something about that later on. Well, I think that this is um, uh, enough for a first part of definitions and to think about that. Um, maybe our musicians can help us contemplate these thoughts. So we have laid the groundwork for our arguments, but I haven't speaking about democracy yet. What has actually happened to democracy? We all want to be democratic all over the world. Ask anyone. But behind this apparent consensus, we can actually see very different democratic regimes taking shape. There is, of course, the idea of direct democracy that relates back to Athens, deliberative democracy. There have been various moments and places in time when something like that has been realized. There is representative democracy where political parties dominate the scene. There is audience democracy in which the political parties have lost their hold over the electorate. It's the media that determine what is important and what is not important. So what is the state of democratic politics today. For 99% of the people, politics is somebody else's affair. It is at most a spectacle on television, something that is happening <coughs> out there in The Hague or Paris or London or Brussels or Washington DC, something in a far distance, and yet it has a terrible power to affect our lives. As an example, think of Dutch soldiers fighting in Uru's gun in Afghanistan. What have we Dutch soldiers to do there? It's international politics that brings them there. Democracy depends on the media. It lives in the media. It's in that black box somewhere. If you turn off the box, there is no politics anymore. 
And what do the media do with politics? They turn it into a spectacle. A spectacle which has to be entertaining and exciting. It has to be like um, a television series or a soap opera. It gets melodrama. That's what it's becoming. Journalists in need of mass audiences within large economic organizations try to make politics as much the doing of ordinary human beings as possible. We get personal views of people and rather not the difficult issues that they deal with. And there is a silent cooperation with politicians seeking to mobilize support. So we get populism and it's structural. People are more interesting than facts. For example, Dutch politics, when you follow the media, is all about Geert Wilders. All the journalists are in some way fascinated by this person. And this takes the place of an analysis of the debates that actually should be going on. It used to be different. I have seen the change in my lifetime. The old idea of representative democracy, yes, that was also distant. Politicians were then also located in The Hague and Brussels and London and Washington DC. But it was based on another concept, that during elections, voters gave their political leaders a mandate, a mandate to govern the country in accordance with their party platform. And they were also allowed to reach compromises with other parties <coughs> in order to form a stable government. That would take four years, and in those four years you needn't involve with politics at all. And after four years you went for the voting booth again, and then the voters would judge the performance. Well, for most of the people this theory <coughs> was a fiction. It didn't affect them really very much. But there were two main reasons for it, justifications in political theory. One was thought of by a man called Schumpeter, a political economist, who said the big advantage of choosing your leaders and delegating power to them and mandating them to govern the country is to, that you get so much free time for yourself. You don't have to involve yourself with politics. You can do better things with your time, like take on, undertake economic affairs, etc. Um, so you must specialize and delegate. And at the next elections, you look at them again. This is called democratic elitism. And then there was another argument raised by uh, Karl Popper, who said, the most important thing in politics is how you get rid of failing leaders. So you should use your elections to vote out of power those people that haven't been doing the governing in the right way. That is the most important thing. And that is why you need a large measure of freedom of speech, so that you can control them. And now the strange thing is that these were two messages. The message in the Schumpeter approach was, you must trust your leaders. The message in the Popper approach was you must distrust your leaders. And both of these messages were supposedly at the same time expressed when somebody went to the voting booth and made a piece of paper red. So in voting you were supposed to have said as a citizen a very complex thing, like a kind of magic. There was no deliberation needed and nobody was really asking the voters what they thought or felt. That was the old system. And we have moved away from it uh, in a very large measure. In fact, we are at the moment shifting from party democracy, as I described it in this way, to what uh, a French uh, political scientist, Bernard Manin, has called audience democracy. And in audience democracy, um, you see all kinds of things happening that are different. For instance, why should you select a person to lead in politics? In the old system, it was because he had made a whole career through the party <coughs> and he was knowledgeable, he had some kind of expertise. And the, peop and the party trusted this person to use this expertise to govern the country well. In the new system, politicians are selected for their competence in the media. They have to be able to look good on television and talk well, etc. And whether there's something in their heads is not so important because there are auto cues and they can read their speeches from them. That's the new system. In the old system, political parties thought that they should make a lot of work of their party platforms 
because the voters would read these party platforms and then decide which of the parties A, B, C or D would be their party. That is not the way it works anymore. Um, what happens now is that there are constant opinion polls going on. Uh, Mr. De Hond is doing that in the Netherlands and many people are doing that. And what political parties do is adapt themselves to the dominant trends that come up among the population. So if the population is concerned about security, for instance, political parties are suddenly concerned about security, etc., etc. That is a very different thing. It means also that in the old system there was one moment when you went voting, and then there were four quiet years, and then you went again to voting, four quiet years. There is now a continual measuring of opinion, and these opinion polls become much more important than the actual election results. Important, that is, not for the government, but for the media. The journalists like to know what is happening at this moment. They are not interested in what happened a couple of years ago. They don't know what's going to happen in the future. This is the moment. So if in the opinion polls a certain party is doing very well and another is doing very bad, that reflects relations of power to them. And what has happened, because in the meantime government still has to go on, is that the business of government is usually conducted outside of the site of the media in close negotiations with important organizations and social interests. That's where government is taking place. Think of the AOW drama we've seen in the Netherlands. Uh, the decision that perhaps are the age at which people go and have their pension and receive their um, uh, benefits from the government should go up from 65 to 67. It is now a public debate. But before it was a public debate, the, the employers and the labor unions have had about a year to negotiate in the closed rooms of the Social Economic Council in The Hague about an alternative for the plans of the government. We were not invited as citizens. That is the way politics is usually done. There's a Dutch word for it called polderen. Very nice, uh, very nice word. It's still happening. But at the same time, the political spectacle is also happening and it is focusing on Parliament in The Hague and especially on the Second Chamber. Anything that's happening there, the Second Chamber looks like a theatre, there are cameras. Uh, on the Binnenhof there are about 200 journalists, a little more than members of Parliament, and they're all in for the, the hype of the day. So if there's a small <coughs> scandal, they will blow it up, they will play it out in all attention. And in this way, because you have to make choices here, journalists have become political actors as well. So there is a change from uh, representative democracy to audience democracy. I need to add a little rider to this. I don't think that the change is total. I believe that we can see cultural expectations in modern democracies that like to refer to all three models of democracy mentioned here. We demand politics to be in some way based on open deliberation between the citizens. As if direct democracy were still feasible. And through the use of internet forums it sometimes is feasible. We also have not given up entirely on representative politics because we hope that somehow there will be a quest for the general good. And indeed audience democracy has conquered the space of appearances that Hannah Arendt talked about, and political life is opinion driven. So that's about democracy. It has become more difficult. There is a regime change under, underway and we don't know exactly where it's going to end, but it's changing. And that means that in this condition of plurality, a term of Hannah Arendt, in our expectations about the nature of democratic regimes, it is much harder to be a citizen and also to be a leader performing well in the job of leading. I'm going to give an example of the practical consequences of this. If you look at the popularity of political leaders today, which leaders are popular today? That is all the leaders that are doing the opposition politics from Parliament. That is not only Geert Wilders, but also <coughs> Alexander Pechtold. And they are doing well. And which political, political leaders are doing very badly? That are the leaders of the government, Mr. Balkenende and Mr. Bos. Why would that be? Could there be a structural explanation in the way they are portrayed in media politics? 
I think that the expectation of audience democracy is becoming that the political leader must be visible on the screen as a member of parliament and not so much as a member of the government. So that in actual practice, the real leaders of the Christian Democrats are Mr. Van Geel and of the Labour Party is Mrs. Hamer. They are the real leaders according to the logic of audience democracy. And since there are other, some, some other leaders as well, this creates a lot of confusion. So my advice would be, if you want to be a political leader, announce that you're going to take part in parliament and that you're not going to enter the cabinet, that you need some other guys to do that. That's a practical application of these uh, insights into the changes in democracy. I hope this again gives some <coughs> food for thought and I hope that the band can play some more. So now comes the really hard question, the one I have been postponing. How can we be a citizen and even a representative or even a political leader in these difficult and changed conditions of the democratic polis? If there is a regime change going on, how can we act in such a way that we have it all? We would like to have a representative democracy that is also a spectacle involving the people and has room for public deliberation. And I hope that this, this is an example of an open question. I think that everybody should find their answers for that and I hope you have ideas about this. <coughs> I'm interested in your hopes and expectations and opinions about this issue. Seeing the urgency of the economical and ecological and political crisis, this is an important issue still. But I'm also going to tell my own personal story. And let me say first that as a citizen and even more as a politician, you have to find a balance between your idealism, the things that motivated you to go into politics in the first place, and the realities of political life. And it is unclear how this has to be achieved. But let me first tell you a couple of stories about why this is so important. I went into politics myself as a member of the Dutch Labour Party when I was asked whether I would like to be the chairman of a committee. And this committee had to write a new program of principles for the Social Democratic Party. The old program of principle dating from the 1970s was outdated. It stated, for instance, that my party was for um, uh, taking over uh, production, produ uh, factories, etc., and things like that, and they thought it was completely uh, old-fashioned, had to be modernized, and I should be the chairman. And I thought this was interesting, and I mentioned this in the following way, that we would prepare some kind of preliminary uh, plan, and then organize a big discussion in all parts of the party, and then we would revise our plan, and then there would be a conference and we would vote on that. That was the ordinary procedure in the party. And I thought that, um, well, let's share some ideas and have some debates. But I soon discovered that many of the most fervent participants in these discussions were people who either didn't want to change anything, they thought the old program was perfect, or had very outspoken ideas about this new program and thought that all other suggestions were mere nonsense. So what was happening here? I discovered that idealism can soon deteriorate into dogmatism and ideology. And ideology is the belief that your own side has all the answers and that you can find all the answers by simply going back to your own principles and you don't have to take the principles of the other side seriously. For instance, there's always a debate going on within social democracy between those people who say um, we are for a strong economy and that means that workers in the economy have to be empowered, etc., etc. And people who say, well, we are for a durable economy. We have to have the green values, we have to limit production, etc. It's a big clash and both parties are not prepared to listen to each other, it soon appeared. So what we did is, is still try to develop some new principal program for the Dutch Labour Party. And then um, by the time this came up for treatment in the general conference, 
there was a small uh, coup going on in the party, which meant that the chairman of the party was suddenly deposed and a new person became a chairperson at interim, and Mrs. Hamers, by the way. And um, this led to a conference where the complete program that we had prepared with the old chairperson uh, was defeated. There were hundreds of amendments, uh, some of them were accepted, some of them were rejected. The whole program wasn't brought to the vote and at the end nobody knew where they stood anymore. It had all ended in failure. And I would think that um, the failure was due to the idea that you can have simple ideological answers to complex problems. So that's one problem, that idealism can soon deteriorate into dogmatism and ideology. And how can you avoid that? How can you avoid that happening? That's my first problem. There's also the side of realism. And I have another story about that. Um, that um, I encountered when, as a result of having become visible through this activity for the political party, I came on the list for the Senate which was an enormous bonus from this failed activity that I could become a member of the Senate. And um, when you go to the Senate, you meet two kinds of people. You meet people there, like yourself, who have idealist motives and think the Senate is there to improve the quality of our legislation. That's our job. And there are people there who say, well, the Senate is there because I can do business with other people and um, we can do a little bit of power politics, and sometimes I vote like this, and sometimes I vote like that. And why did they have this attitude? Well, when you become a member of an organization like the Senate, you are quickly confronted with the fact that you are really in an almost impossible position to deal with everything. The Senate has to debate on about uh, 400 laws every year, and um, this works like a kind of machine. The laws enter the Senate and then there's a committee that takes it up and can ask questions and the government can give answers and then at the end there's a, a public debate and then there's a vote. But who is to, to going to do all the, all, the, all, all the questioning? Not all of the members of the Senate are going to do that. It's going to be divided among the people that are part of political fractions in the Senate and each gets a number of statutes and it's their statutes and they must persuade the other members to follow their lead in what to do with the statute. So there's always a very small number of people who really decide on the statute. And then, to make it worse, um, there are also a large number of statutes that nobody is interested in. Of course, the big ones, like changing the social security system, get a lot of attention, but there are also smaller ones that people say, well, we call this um, uh, a hammering experience, we are not going to go into this at all. And this means that some of the statutes are simply not going to be investigated at all. And as a new member, I was curious about this. I wondered, how about these statutes that nobody is talking about? Let me uh, pick up a few, select it randomly, and look into uh, their backgrounds. And to my great surprise, I discovered all kinds of interesting questions and important questions that could be put about these statutes that had, nobody had looked at. Well, not nobody, because the government had looked at it and the Council of State, but the second chamber had overlooked these statutes <coughs> altogether, and the first chamber was doing the same kind of thing. So when you're in the middle of such a machine-like organization, life becomes difficult, and you realize that when voting time comes, a whole list of all these statutes are being, being passed, you are supposed to agree to all of these statutes that you haven't even read. So what are you doing there? you are, in fact, um, taking decisions that in, in which you have to trust that other people have been looking very well. Well, that's realism, that you have to do that. There is no other way to make it work. You have to trust others, um, and your power is limited, and you can't change everything. But people who have experienced that a lot often tend to become cynical and to um, take up an attitude that everything is negotiable and ideals do not matter and as long as the state is governed moderately reasonable, it's, it's okay. And the next step beyond cynicism is despair or an aversion of politics altogether. And I think that idealism that gets out of hand and becomes dogmatism and realism that gets out of hand and becomes cynicism are two things that you must avoid when you go into politics. 
So how can you strike the balance? Good to take a little water to increase the attention, of course. Um, I think that as a personal attitude, the thing to do is to cultivate the virtue of perspectivism that we encounter in the rhetorical tradition that we can learn from Aristotle, which means that you have to empathize with the other standpoint and make it as strong as it can be before arguing against it and forming your final judgment. And interestingly, that often works. A good effect of the debate on principles in the Social Democratic Party was that I wasn't the only one that was dissatisfied with the way it worked. There was an, a circle of people who were actually thinking that it was now time to get a really good new program and who um, had some thoroughgoing debates in which they were prepared to look into the point of view of other approaches. And out of this debate came the idea that in fact if you look at it, um, there are no exclusively good or bad principles relating to social, a social democratic party. It's not only about equality or solidarity or freedom, it's about all of them. And it's also about um, durability <coughs> and good governance, etc., etc. And that in fact there is a whole pool of important principles, and some of them are shared by other progressive and democratic parties. And if you realize this, it is possible to look for compromises with other parties, referring to principles that are partly your own and partly principles of the others. And these could be principle compromises with very different parties, but they could still be principled compromises. I think that was a, um, a good development. And then some of these people managed a couple of years later to really change the principal program of the Social Democratic Party. They had a better text than we had, but the content was completely the same as what we had thought of. So there was a happy end after all. But as my mention of mentality change makes clear, personal attitudes are not enough. We need structural adaptations as well. And so I think it's good to, to have discussions about the way you can make the machine of legislation work better, make it more reflective. And there are very simple measures by which you can do that. One of them is by making it possible for the Senate that when they see that a statute has a certain problem, that they refer it back to the second chamber with uh, suggestions as to how to improve the statute and that they have to deal with it there. In that way, a lot of problems can be removed from the legislative uh, proposals. And it's also possible to um, change the balance of forces in the legislative system. I have to tell a little bit about how the system works, I suppose. Um, the government makes a plan for a law. This law is then advised about by the Council of State. It is debated in the second chamber and then in the first chamber and it's voted upon. That's the ordinary proceedings. And if there is an imbalance in this process, what you can do is bring in new actors. And one of these new actors was the Budgeting and Accounting Office in the Netherlands, the Algemene Rekenkamer. They are an independent agency. They are supposed to check the government's expenditures, but they also give advice on the way legislation is actually handled in practice. And at some uh, uh, moment when I was a member of the Senate, they brought out a number of reports in which they said, there's one thing wrong with most legislation in the Netherlands, and that is that when it's made, nobody is asking how government agencies are going to implement those plans, and nobody is going to ask how citizens are going to profit from this implementation. There's a, there's a, a big distance between the nice intentions and the way organizations work, and that should change. We picked that up in, in the Senate, and there were two of my colleagues who made a, a big project out of this, and as a result of this, we organized a conference where we invited these people from the Budget and Accounting Office, members of the Council of State, people from uh, executive agencies, some concerned citizens and ourselves, and we talked over these problems and, came, and out of that came a whole list of recommendations as to what to do. So in that way you can actually affect a change in the balance of powers 
and, and there are these structural solutions to these, to these problems. But in the end, finding a balance between realism and idealism is something that everybody has to do for himself or for herself. And I think that it also requires something like public rituals, that you go through certain activities together with the other people with whom you are uh, in a political situation. In my party, in the Senate, we had such a public ritual. It was customary that at the end of our meetings, somebody would read a poem. And we would listen to the poem and then go our way. And very often these poems would reflect topics that were actually being discussed, and they would provide some opportunity to think about <coughs> these problems. For instance, we had at one time the decision about the Dutch euthanasia law. This was perhaps the most controversial law that was passed in the period that I was in the Senate. And there were uh, 36,000 petitions from people against this law and 36,000 petitions from people in favor of the law. Exactly the same amount, strangely. Um, uh, at the day when we were discussing this law, there was a silent protest march surrounding the Binnenhof where 10,000 people were walking with placards saying that this law was a way of establishing death. These were the anti-euthanasia forces. And any time we looked through the windows, we would see this very impressive silent march going on of people having to decide on euthanasia. In my political party, we were in favor of the euthanasia law, but some of the members who were of a Catholic persuasion <coughs> were very doubtful about this. But we thought that in the end, um, it would be better not to hide the problems of euthanasia under the carpet and let doctors and patients discuss them openly and um, uh, help people to achieve a dignified end of life. That was our, our, our conclusion. But <coughs> when we had this debate in, at the end, I was, it was my turn to read a poem. And I then read a poem by a Dutch poet called Gerrit Achterberg. And Gerrit Achterberg is one of the great Dutch poets who um, was for a long time um, a, a patient in a closed mental institution. And he was hospitalized there because he had murdered somebody. And psychiatrists then thought that he was deranged. And for many years he was in this psychiatric hospital where he wrote some of the beauti most beautiful poems in the Dutch language, Gerrit Achterberg. And one of those poems is about the power of doctors to determine your life to say what your diagnosis really is and to use the power of language to establish who you are, what your freedom is and what is going to happen to you. They use their terministic screens to chain you in. And in this politics, this was, in this poem, this was very cynically and, and, and strongly worded. And I read this poem and my message to my colleagues was, we can establish a system but it will depend on the quality of what doctors and patients will do and the way they are actually able to use their rights, whether it's going to work or not. We have to be sensitive all the time that a good system like a euthanasia law is not going to get out of balance because people cannot handle it and perhaps take the wrong kinds of decisions. That was the message hidden in this, um, this poem. And I think that uh, having a ritual like reading poetry is one way of, in a very personal way, establishing your balance and thinking about what your ideals are and what the realistic considerations are and how you can match them together. And that is also the way I am going to end uh, this uh, last lecture. Um, I think it wouldn't be nice if I would have the last word in the last lecture. I'm going to give that to a poet. poet. And the poet is uh, Miroslav Holub who is a Czechoslovakian uh, poet, and one of the great poets of Europe. And one of his poems is called Although. Although a poem arises when there's nothing else to be done, although a poem is a last attempt at order when one can't stand disorder any longer, although poets are most needed when freedom, vitamin C, communications, laws, and hypertension therapy are also most needed. Although to be an artist is to fail, and art is fidelity to failure, as Samuel Beckett says, a poem is not one of the last, but one of the first things of man.